You may have seen these volunteers in the past. They wear these bright neon yellow shirts. They were called poll monitors of the past. Now they're called vote protectors. It's kind of calling out what we're doing, um, which is really protecting voters and protecting the ballot. The rebranding comes amid what Democracy North Carolina describes as a difficult year with a heated partisan atmosphere, the fight for racial equity, and the pandemic. Tell me what it is you're protecting voters from. So our vote protectors will be out there monitoring polling places, making sure that they are open on time, making sure that cur curbside voting is up and running, um, documenting lines, um, and documenting any issues that come up. Project manager Carolyn Fry says her group receives hundreds of complaints every election from voters wondering why they're not on the voter rolls or a polling site running out of ballots. That actually happened at one polling site during the primary this year. In the past, voter protectors interacted with voters one-on-one -on -one at the polls. This year, Fry says it'll be different. So is there a potential problem by having people at polling sites encountering voters? I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that we are going to be instructing our vote protectors to take a step back this year. Fry says vote protectors have the option to be contact-free at polling sites. We're not going to be instructing folks to go and invade people's personal spaces. They will be instructed to have their own space, invite people in, but not approach. Vote protectors will be on the ground at polling sites for three days this year, the first and last day of early voting, as well as on Election Day. In Greensboro, Bill O'Neill, WXII 12 News. And if you'd like to volunteer to be a vote protector, here's what you need to do. Go to democracync.org and sign up. I'm Lauren Walsh. We're live here at the Wyndham Championship, where Webb Simpson had a very solid performance in the first round. He says this is like a home golf course for him, and it showed. We'll fill you in coming up. Plus a warning about that package you didn't order or don't recall buying, where masks are coming from and what you should do if you get one of these. When his life was taken, he didn't get the chance to live a full life. A group calling for an end to violence in the triad. Hear from two mothers who have lost their sons who are begging people to put the guns down.
Your WXII 12 forecast is always available on the free WXII 12 app. Stay connected with meteorologist Michelle Kennedy on her Facebook page. Well, officially it is day one of the Wyndham Championship at Sedgefield Country Club in Greensboro. Our Lauren Walsh is live in the Gate City with a look at who's leading the pack early on. Lauren, the rain looks like it's holding off for now too. That's good news. Yeah, it is. Don't jinx us here, Brianna. Now, earlier this week, we heard Webb Simpson talk about how much he loves the course here at Sedgefield Country Club. And the Raleigh native backed that up with an impressive first round at the Wyndham Championship this morning. It was a bit of an up and down day for Webb. The Wake Forest native posted six birdies, but he also shot a double bogey on 13. Simpson ended with a birdie on the 18th hole to tally a total score of 66 in the first round. And Webb said he had to keep a level head to finish at four under par. It's a golf course you can make a lot of birdies, so as hard as it is in the moment, you just got to stay patient, and I did that, and, you know, I knew I had 15 coming up. You know, birdie opportunities at 16 and 17. I was able to get those and, uh, you know, turned in one under after being two over, so it was a good, kind of a good hanging in there for me. Again, Webb shot four under par today, and we don't want to say exactly where he is on the leaderboard because it is still a fluid situation with some golfers still out here on the course finishing their first round. However, as an update, there is a three-way tie for first today between Harold Varner, Tom Sloan, excuse me, Roger Sloan, and Tom Hoagie. They are all at eight under par. And we'll have more for you on the Wyndham coming up at six in sports. Reporting live from Sedgefield Country Club in Greensboro, I'm Lauren Walsh, WXII 12 News. Good stuff. Thank you, Lauren. And we'd like to thank each one of you who donated to our virtual food drive yesterday with Second Harvest Food Bank. Look at those numbers. Because of you, we were able to collect more than $51,000, almost 52 grand in donations. That'll be enough to provide 361,000 meals for hungry families all across the triad. Many of them are getting ready to send their little boys and girls back to school. And while the food drive is over, the need most certainly is not. You can find out many, many ways to donate to Second Harvest Food Bank by visiting our website, W. WXII12.com slash second harvest. Turning to our forecast, it's become all too familiar this week. The day starts off sunshine, bright, beautiful, and then the afternoon comes, and we've got some serious storms to talk about. Want to check in with meteorologist Michelle Kennedy. Michelle, who's getting hit today? Oh, a lot of folks in the western foothills, and now the trial also seeing some of those thunderstorms brew right overhead, even in Guilford County. So maybe Sedgefield Country Club area, we could get some of those heavier rains moving through for the Wyndham Championship, too. Look at the spin in the atmosphere. We've got lots of surface features here. We also have a little bit of upper level help and a stationary front to our north. So this puts us in position to see these afternoon thunderstorms, the heat of the day, and then getting some waves of energy at the surface and aloft all at the same time, helping to bring in, unfortunately, flash flood concerns. We do have warnings up for Wilkes County as we go out into areas of Watauga, parts of uh, Ash County, and that's going to include a little bit of also Surrey County. You can see here. Watches are going to stay up though through tomorrow until noontime. Our advisories are also now in play for folks down through Davidson County getting hit with heavy downpours and also southern sections of Yadkin County where we've seen some two to three inches just within the last 48 hours and more than an inch so far from storms today. All right, temperatures as we get you into the overnight hours after scattered showers and storms wind down, we see a passing shower chance through early morning. Little sunshine trying to peek through some of those overclass, uh, overcast clouds. 80 degrees by around noontime and taking your temperatures up there to near 84. And later in the afternoon, those showers, those thunderstorms still at about a 60% chance. But it does look to be a dinner hour activation for folks in the tried and a little sooner in the mountains and foothills. So we take you down with fog early morning temperatures into the 70s and then near 82 degrees late afternoon with a rain chance of 60%. We see those temperatures in the mountains too in the low 60s for early morning areas of patchy dense fog impact hours really beginning after the nine o'clock hour where we could begin to see some of those soaking showers and then thunderstorms filling in for the afternoon highs in those mid to upper 70s tomorrow. So morning showers and patchy dense fog. Then we get you through the noon hour and we'd expect to see those afternoon storms building mainly west. Late day storms likely for the tried as well. The heavy rain threat that does not go away. We're not going to see a system really roll through. That front doesn't clear us out anytime soon. We've got this other feature too as we climb a little higher in the atmosphere up over Kentucky. This is creating even more spin. So along with the surface features, we're getting some good lift out there and the thunderstorms are firing as a result. And unfortunately, that does mean some heavier rains. You can see showers starting to spin up 
over Burlington, Yanceyville, and you can see it really forming along that surface trough that is to our west. So we've got showers out through Burlington now, Anderson. Those will turn into thunderstorms too and could bring in those soaking rains like what you're seeing over Fairgrove. And they're just pretty much sitting here. They're really not moving very fast, folks. And that's what helps to create those flash flood concerns, plus just flood advisories in general. So we could see some of the ponding on the roadways. We're looking at the streams and creeks coming up. Make sure the kids are staying out of those storm drains too, the big ones that we're talking about. Yeah, you don't want them to venture into those anytime soon. You've got four inch totals coming in in Rowan County, southwestern sections of Davidson County last 48 hours and some heavier totals too in southern sections here as we get you into Forsyth County and near Davidson. Watching though mostly for folks in Wilkes County right now out through Boone. We had flash flood warnings there last night. We've got another round here and those showers out of Dobson starting to wind down for now, but more storms are still possible along with some patchy fog that could form and take a look at some of those monthly totals so far. We're going to be adding to those now, but more than four inches in Winston Salem, Lexington, of course, more than two inches today and your storm chances. They don't wind down until we hit about Monday with scattered storm chances winding down a bit with upper 80s and a little more sunshine. Storms continue Tuesday and Wednesday for impact days. All right, thank you, Michelle. Let's check traffic now. Here's I-40 and Elm Eugene Street in Greensboro. Currently, things look pretty good. Streets are dry, although it's very gray out there. Good news here is traffic is light. Well, we have quite the love story for you next. This woman married the love of her life at his hospital bed. How long he's been fighting for his own life. And putting students to the test to see if they know how to social distance. Jeff Ross and has kids of all ages show us if they know how far away they need to stand. We'll show you who passes and who fails.
A critically ill COVID patient is now married to the love of his life, but they are spending their first days as husband and wife in the hospital. Back in July, Carlos Munoz was getting ready to get married to his longtime girlfriend, Grace, but then he came down with coronavirus and had to be hospitalized. It's been a month, more than a month, in fact, and he's still there. Carlos's nurse recently came up with the idea for Carlos and Grace to say their vows in the hospital. They did so yesterday. Congratulations. We've warned you about suspicious seed packets showing up in the mail. Now people are reporting that they're getting masks that they never ordered. Across the country, people say they're getting a package with two face masks and no note. Recipients say they took the label and it looked like it came from Shanghai, China. They say it even had their cell phone number on there. Experts say this could be an instance of a company sending you an item and then putting up a fake review that's known as brushing. If this happens to you, reach out to the Better Business Bureau. I know it won't stop it, but hopefully it will slow it down for us to take our communities back. A heartbroken mother, she lost her son. Now she's asking others to do whatever they can to end gun violence. We'll explore the effort she and other parents are leading this weekend. And we're talking about the showers. The thunderstorms now moving very slowly over areas of uptown Lexington back into Moxville. And we're going to see those heavy downpours bring in soaking showers one to two inches possible. We'll talk about flash flood warnings that are up right now for folks in Wilkes County. It's coming up next. From WXII 12 News, this is Breaking News. Breaking news on this Thursday, the president is holding a news conference. We have a lot of local news to get to and active storms over the Piedmont Triad. So if you'd prefer to watch the president, you can do so right now over on the WXII 12 News Facebook page. 
New day, another chance for heavy rain showers mm -hmm. as storms are popping up again all over the Piedmont Triad. And this could lead to flash flooding for some people. Meteorologist Michelle Kennedy is keeping an eye on the rain for us. Michelle, where are the showers at now? Well, these showers and thunderstorms continue to really fire in the mountains and the western foothills. This is where we have a trough at the surface extended, and this is creating the focus for the heaviest of downpours. Lots of lightning, too, and you can see that beautiful visible satellite imagery as we started to fill the clouds in everywhere today across most of the triad, even if you don't have the storms. Mount Airy, Dobson starting to get a little bit of a break, but it's farther south as we go into Wilkes County and back into Watauga County right now where we have those flash flood warnings. That's going to be up until about 715 for folks in Watauga County until 1015 for Wilkes County. We still have rain going on there and estimates of anywhere from one to two inches with these thunderstorms and then you combine that with the last 48 hours and we've got some three to four inch totals going in some spots. Now look at the storms that have continued to fire also and beginning to form overhead from Greensboro out over northern Randolph County filling in over Lexington, Moxville. Some of these storms are going to move to the east and southeast very slowly. They're creeping along at about three to five miles an hour. They're going to drop in some very heavy rains and this could really create those rises in the streams and creeks, creating local ponding concerns. So we've got some stream advisories out there and local flood advisories. Clemens and Harmony Grove, you're going to see this one particular thunderstorm with the heaviest of rains on the way to you within the next few minutes here. And showers and thunderstorms continue to rise to about 40,000 feet. So you can see the soaking rains within these. You could have some good downdrafts too, could be gusty at times and lots of frequent lightning. So you want to stay off the roads during these thunderstorms over the next few days. And we do expect to see more afternoon and evening development similar to what we have today for your Friday. Look at the last 12 hours. It's just from early this morning. You can see the showers here filling in now over the western foothills and eventually we'll see more storms tonight. So the next few hours pretty stormy for folks from Lexington through Winston Salem and Greensboro. They should hold together, move slowly and bring in the threat of some flash flooding for some. Your flash flood watches will remain up for the mountains and foothills through noon tomorrow and then we'll get a little sunshine in here with afternoon storms starting to fire again by around two or three o'clock and then more storms heading into the weekend. We'll talk about it. It's coming up. Happening now in Winston-Salem, police are trying to find the person who shot a nine-year-old in the neck. Investigators say the child and an adult were trying to leave the scene of an argument on Forest Hills Avenue. The Triad family is also dealing with the death of a 15-year-old shot and killed on Cleveland Avenue yesterday afternoon. Police are still searching for shooters in both of these instances, and they ask if you know anything to reach out. Well, before these shootings even happened, parents had organized a procession of hearses for a rally this weekend. It's an effort to curb the violence and save children, fathers and mothers the pain of losing loved ones. Tonight's WXI 12 Talitha Vickers spoke exclusively with two moms with deep rooted pain who said they need your help to save your children. Two mothers of sons. We are losing children. Our children are dying at the hands of somebody else. To lose a child is devastating, very devastating. <clears throat> it is an unconsolable grief. Crystal Thompson's son, Christopher Thompson, was murdered right in front of her home in 2014. The case remains unsolved. He was my baby. Um, I miss him. It's not a day that goes by that I don't. Three years later, Natasha Miles' son, Kamiko James, was shot on the campus of NCANT State University. The trauma that my son suffer suffered when he was shot, it disfigured him from neck down. When I looked in the casket and looked at my son, I did not know the man that was laying there. A part of me is good with that because that's not how I wanted to remember my son. But what I want the community to know is that I had the opportunity to look at my son's feet. And that's, that's how I identified my son, by his toes. So people don't understand that when they choose to pick up a gun, they're affecting families forever. I'll never be the same and I know my family won't ever be the same. My son was a staple in my family. He was a true staple in my family. 
And now, yet again, more families are suffering, torn apart by recent gun violence. Over the last five years, I know there's been approximately over 100 black men, black and Hispanic men, and children. The youngest that I'm aware of at this moment is a five-year-old child who was sitting in the living room of their home, killed by someone who decided to shoot a gun, being reckless and careless. And, and ultimately have no regard for human life. In support of these families and in an effort to stop the violence, this Sunday, more than a dozen hearse will drive through Winston-Salem as a symbolic message to put down the guns before it's too late. If we can save just one, it, it means a lot to me. I know this won't bring my son back, but if I can speak on behalf of some of the other mothers that have gone through, and I pray to God that none of the others have to go through it. If this can be their reality, and um, you know, seeing it firsthand, I know it won't stop it, but hopefully it will slow it down for us to take our communities back. Our local families don't have justice. Some of our families don't have justice. And there are people out there that know who killed these children. And they won't speak out. As a community, we have to come together to be about change. And I say let change begin on Sunday. Talitha Vickers, WXII 12 News. Again, a reminder, the procession of hearses and Stop the Violence rally is Sunday, starting at 4 in the afternoon. It's going to go from Bowman Gray Stadium's East Parking Lot. Then the rally is going to be at Rupert Bell Park. That's at 1501 Mount Zion Place. Families are asking for your support, and they ask you to wear a mask if you plan to attend. Checking traffic right now, a live look, Salem Parkway near South Hawthorne Road and Peters Creek Parkway in Winston-Salem. You can see just a couple of cars out right now, no heavy delays to report. A more powerful shower head, the new rule change being proposed right now that could impact your morning or evening routine. Plus, a challenge, can you estimate how far six feet is? Jeff Rawson breaks out the measuring tape to find out. But first, here's a look at how stocks finished this Thursday on Wall Street.
WXII 12 News is always available on the free WXII 12 app. Stay connected to Brianna Connor on her Facebook page. The Trump administration is proposing a new rule that would allow your shower fixture to push out more water. The U.S. government is proposing to ease water efficiency standards. The president recently complained about water flow problems while eating at a Whirlpool manufacturing plant in Ohio. Under federal law, the fixture can't put more than two and a half gallons of water out per minute, no matter how many shower heads you have. The new proposal would let each one spray that amount individually. Some consumer and appliance standards groups say that would be unnecessary and wasteful. Hank Williams Jr. is set to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame later this year. His many, many hits include Family Tradition and All My Rowdy Friends Are Coming Over Tonight. And he's released 53, 53 full studio albums. Williams' father was in the very first Country Music Hall of Fame class. That was back in 1961. The Country Music Association opted not to hold a traditional ceremonial announcement at the Hall of Fame Museum in Nashville because of the ongoing pandemic. Induction ceremony is traditionally held at the Hall of Fame in October. The other two honorees of the three-member class of 2020 are Marty Stewart and songwriter Dean Dillon. Hi, I'm Jeff Ross, and coming up, we've been hearing it for months. Stay six feet away from everyone, but do you actually know what six feet looks like? We're about to test you. It's our tape measure challenge, and wait until you see the results. Eye-opening, next. We're getting some reports in from Wilkes County that some parts in downtown Wilkesboro of 2nd Street are closed due to the heavy rain and flash flooding concerns. We've got lots of rain also filling in over uptown Lexington, Moxville at this hour and storms beginning to form over Winston-Salem and Greensboro at this hour too. We're going to have more details on your flash flood concerns and a look ahead to sunnier times. It's coming up.
Tonight on Rawson Reports, a new eye-opening experiment. We have heard the advice for months, stay six feet apart. But do you know how far six feet really is? Better yet, do your kids know as they get ready to head back to school? Our national consumer correspondent Jeff Rawson is pulling out the tape measure for this one. Hi, uh, yeah, believe it or not, knowing how to eyeball six feet is actually harder than it sounds, especially for kids. Think about it. Everything from their perspective is different. They're all the way down here. The other day I asked my kids if they could show me what six feet looks like. I was just curious. It was not pretty. They were way off and it got me thinking they kind of need to know that, right? Especially if they head back to school might be more important now than ever. So I'm using my trusty tape measure here to see if kids can measure up. Check this out. We are testing kids of all ages, and it starts out well. I'm gonna ask you just to grab that tape measure from your mom and pull it out and walk out what you think six feet is. We watch as 11-year-old Adrienne takes a step back and back and back. You got six feet? Yeah. Mom, verdict? Six five. <laughs> wow, so actually you can, you know what? Stay six five away. That's good. Must be a good day for the 11-year-olds. Caitlin, 11 years old, does well too. Five feet, nine inches, pretty good. Nice job. Her eight-year-old brother, Zach, not so bad either. Five foot, 10 inches, but you're right there, man. But then things go downhill fast. This nine-year-old has a really good idea. Count his steps backwards, but four feet, four inches. Kid after kid. Five feet. Just can't get it. But we have high hopes for this teenager who says she can. Mom, flip it over. What's the verdict? Four feet, eight inches. Ah, <laughs> See, so let's show you what six feet actually is. Keep walking. Keep walking. Stop. That's six feet. What do you think? It's pretty big. <laughs> More than you thought. Yeah. Kids don't really know what six feet social distancing should look like. Maybe we need to practice it more <laughs> at home. But it's our youngest volunteers, five and six year olds, off by the most. That you think that's six feet? Okay, let's turn that over, mom. How much is that actually? Two feet something. Turn it over, mom. Just over three feet. Yep. Three feet, three inches. So way off. Let's show you what six okay. feet is. Come on let's back. Keep let's keep walking back. And stop. Longer than you oh. thought, huh? What does this experiment show you? For little kids, I think it might be a little harder to gauge that distance. They need stickers on the floor exactly. to tell kids what it is. Because when you're a little kid, everything's bigger. Mm -hmm. This feels like six feet. What a great teaching moment for the kids and us parents. And we had some laughs too. Further than you thought. Yeah, how much did my sister get? <laughs> <laughs> Good to see some things never change. By the way, we sanitize the tape measure before and after each child. This is a great experiment to do at home with your kids. In fact, if you record it, we'd love to see it. Use the hashtag Ross and Reports, post your video on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Let's see how your kids do again. Use the hashtag Ross and Reports. Maybe it'll end up on TV. Hope it helps. Back to you. All righty, thank you, Jeff. Well, I know this is more than six feet, Michelle Kennedy, and I know you were sick of telling us about storm chances, yet oh, here we are. Here we are. I would love to tell you about more sunshine and times that you can see a lot of it. It doesn't happen, though, very frequently over the next couple of days, certainly into the weekend. It's going to be iffy to get in a lot of good sun. You've got storms that really begin to fire up each afternoon, and this is what we've seen today, a nearly stationary storm system that develops through the afternoon hours as those storms don't have really a lot of localized wind to help move it along in the there's no surface front coming through. Instead, it's just set up right over the mountains and foothills, and that's where the storms converge with that moisture coming in from the beaches and moisture that we also have aloft. And so all of this bringing in thunderstorm possibilities. If you're looking at Statesville, Moxville, Lexington right now with heavy thunderstorm activity, you have heavy downpours and flash flood warnings that are up right now in Wilkes County as well as Watauga counties. And as of 414, we had 2nd Street being blocked off for dangerous flowing water near that intersection with Highway 115 in North Wilkesboro. So if you're wondering what may be causing delays. It's all the rain and water on the roadways. We've got that warning up for folks in Wilkes County until 845 and that now extends. It looks like farther south into Iredell County too. And we've got that severe thunderstorm warning that has popped up just now right over areas southwest of Interstate 77 near Statesville. And as you go out toward the uh, Morrisville and Lake Norman area, you're looking at showers, thunderstorms here in Lexington too with Moxville heavy rain. Now the threat of some damaging winds is possible with some of these thunderstorms, but you're looking at 
at frequent lightning. You've got the heavy rains that could cause the flash flooding and heavy rain does continue to be the main threat. The storms earlier at about 40,000 feet. Now nah, they're dropping down to about 35,000 feet, but they're also starting to move a little bit more to the east. Aerial flood advisories for Davidson continue until 630. We've got another concern for flooding around the streams and creeks, and this is in Yakin County. We have seen almost two inches of rain there just in the last 12 hours. Also for folks out in eastern sections of Wilkes County, that advisory continues, even though you may not be in that flash flood warning in the, in the northern sections, but watching for that threat. Of course, the watch extends through tomorrow at noon. You're at 84 degrees in Greensboro. Now we have 81 in Ashboro, 86 in Burlington. It's been a mostly dry day, actually, from Greensboro through Winston-Salem. We had a lot of sunshine trying to peek through the clouds. I wouldn't call it full sun by any means, but you've got overcast skies that'll be with us again tomorrow morning. Notice a little bit more sunshine has worked its way in over Yanceyville and Reedsville. You've been dry up until about now as the clouds are starting to form and fill in with storm chances. So if you're dining out, you've got those rain chances that really build for the afternoon hour. So we get you into 2 and 3 o'clock, mainly west in the foothills in the triad. Your storm chances do start to build as we get into about 5, 6 o'clock with more widespread activity possible then. Now our hour by hour forecast not typically uh, handling the system very well, but we can show you that the scattered showers and storms certainly more impressive once we get you into the late day hours and could continue into the overnight hours too from Friday night into your Saturday morning. Some rounds of storms. Rainfall totals are forecast anywhere from you know a quarter of an inch where you get maybe just the outskirt of that thunderstorm bringing in some sprinkles to some areas getting two to three inches. So our European model giving you a better average here as we get you into next week from yeah, we've got storm chances almost every day in the seven day, but by Monday we might get a break before we finally fill in with those totals at two to three inches area wide. So if you haven't seen the storms yet, you will likely see those storms in the next few days. Mountain temperatures tomorrow morning at 63. Better storm chances for you starting around the noon hour. We continue to ramp that up in the foothills with three o'clock temperatures near 82 degrees in the foothills and then clouds form and should limit those highs, keeping us at 84 in the triad. Your storm chances, as we've talked about, more numerous late day once we get the heat going. And of course, that surface feature is hanging with us through the next few days too. The seven day forecast showing you that the storms impacted Friday, Saturday, Sunday for better rain chances. A little sunshine may peak through on Monday, taking us into the upper 80s, keeping you though out of the 90s right now and no more impact days Tuesday, Wednesday until we may finally break this pattern down sometime into next weekend. All right, thanks, Michelle. Coming up, a young boy keeping busy this summer and learning life skills. The special project his family has been helping him with to give him some purpose.
Back now with one more check on traffic. Here's what it looks like. US 29 Cone Boulevard in Greensboro. All dry and no major trouble. Well, a boy in South Carolina is spending the summer bringing smiles to family, friends and neighbors. He's turning into quite the salesman. Joe Ripley introduces us to Caleb Hibbs. They come down the sidewalk from every direction. On skates, even on paws. All for the boy who adopted Red Raider pride. Just 10 years ago, Caleb Hibbs' parents adopted him. Caleb was our foster son. Um, we got him when he was two weeks old. He was born addicted to opiates and he was in the intensive care unit. Later diagnosed with cerebral palsy and Cabezas syndrome, a rare genetic disorder that causes intellectual and speech disabilities. Nothing Caleb couldn't overcome. When school shut down back in the spring, his mom, Amy, crafted Caleb's Corner. He has a way of uniting people. He doesn't know a stranger. All of our neighbors know him because they don't, he doesn't give them a choice. Good job, Good job Caleb. Caleb. A way to sell snacks and even feed a few with a smile to build critical social skills. Be able to do something that can give him purpose, that he can have ownership of. It's even more pronounced that we're overcoming even being in a pandemic. But Caleb, I just feel like if we don't give these children the opportunity and we don't give them an opportunity to practice, they're never gonna be able to learn. We'll see you in a minute. He's learned plenty with neighbors, teachers, and friends to cheer him on. Yeah, very excited. We haven't seen a lot of those smiles lately just because she loves her family, but she loves um, her friends as well. Allison Huffstutler's daughter, Haley, has Rett syndrome. Right Severe form of autism kept her in therapy this summer. Haley did get to make it for the last day of Caleb's Corner before school starts. Within the disability community, it requires um, a village to raise these children. And so that just means supporting each other through things like this or going to events or helping them fundraise for cures for our children. Support from miles around for the boy with special needs who found special purpose in a pandemic. Joe Ripley, WYFF News 4, Simpsonville. WXII 12 News at 6 starts right now. Sending kids back to daycare. Protocols and safety measures are in place, but is it enough to keep your little ones safe? Plus, that just goes to show these people behind the guns care about nothing in life but what's in front of their eyes and what they're chasing. Children are some of the most recent victims of gun violence in Winston-Salem. What investigators are saying about the search for suspects and what a mom who lost her son three years ago wants all of us to understand. And taking matters into their own hands, what leaders in one local city are doing to get rid of a Confederate monument. Verse at six, heavy rain and flooding continue to be a threat for some of you watching us right now. It has been the theme recently, hasn't it? Just look at this video just into the newsroom from North Wilkesboro. This is North Main Street under all that water right in front of Main Street Music and Loan. The parking lot is flooded. Michelle Kennedy, good gracious, those folks Ooh. could use a break. And is any of that coming down to the I-40 proper triad area? You know, 421 for sure. And there is a chance in Interstate 40 at times that we might see some folks stopped at least by ponding on the roadways. We don't have flash flood warnings yet to the east, but we do have, you saw that car out there stranded in the middle of the water. Hopefully those people were able to get out before they became stranded in the water. That is exactly what we mean by flash flooding. You want to stay off the roads, even if you don't have warnings up for folks in the triad. You've just got tremendous downpours and you've got frequent lightning. So you don't want to have to try and dodge those storms by doing any errands at this hour. We also had that report, of course, on the 2nd Street being blocked off for all that dangerous flowing water near Highway 115. Incredible video coming into the newsroom, too. So please stay off the roads. We've got a new severe thunderstorm warning that is south of our viewing area in just a little bit, but watching for damaging winds with that one and frequent lightning, not to mention the intense downpours that are coming through. We've also got the lightning strikes coming through uptown Lexington, Moxville. You're filling in with heavy rains again and this is not good news. We've had several days of heavy downpours off and on, and so this is going to create a concern for some of the ponding, not to mention flash flood concerns as we go forward. So looking at the heavy rains, we're seeing some rainfall totals of one to two inches in Yadkinville just in the last 12 hours. And yesterday we had some of the same total, so very heavy rains and more on the way. All right, we're going to have much more for you. Take a look at Tropical Storm Josephine, and then when we may actually see more sunshine. Alrighty, thank you, Michelle. And don't forget the WXII 12 News mobile app will send you alerts whenever there's rain or lightning or anything else detected in your area. You can even customize the location in the settings. 
The countdown is on and parents are no doubt juggling a whole lot right now. School starts Monday and between trying to figure out how to balance jobs and remote learning, there is also concern about daycares and whether it's safe to send kids back. Bill O'Neill spoke to a child care expert from the YMCA as well as state health officials about daycare protocols. Experts say that the protocols are in place to keep kids safe, but there are no guarantees. It is up to families, parents to decide for themselves whether this is a safe option for their children. So it really depends on the family's needs and uh, comfort level and level of risk within their own family that they have to consider. Susan Perry, a 25-year veteran of early child care development, says North Carolina has protocols in place and inspectors visiting child care centers, making sure those protocols are followed. But is it enough? There is some risk always associated with being in group settings. You really want to try to mitigate that risk. We know there's a tremendous amount now of, of emerging evidence about the effectiveness of wearing those face coverings. Um, we do know that the prevalence of COVID-19 in younger children and how sick they get is, is, is much less than in older children and adults. Um, but that's not to say they don't ever get sick. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services has made it clear that lots of places are not a good idea to go to right now. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. are child care facilities a good idea at this point in time to go to? Well, that's a really great question. And, you know, I, I think we all recognize that right now there's not a vaccine for COVID-19. And so all the things that we're doing uh, to take good precautions are really about mitigating risks. A spokesman for the YMCA of Greensboro says they're doing everything possible to mitigate risk. Ebony Burnett, Family Services Director at the Hayes Taylor YMCA, says their summer program didn't have any problems with COVID. Is there something that uh, you can tell me as a parent or grandparent um, that th this is uh, something that I should be willing to try because there's nothing more important in my life? Yeah, so we have a lot of uh, safety protocols in place for our children and for our families. Those protocols include wearing masks, hand washing, temperature checks, and limiting groups to no more than 10 kids in the event someone does get sick, that it doesn't spread throughout the program. It's not going to take much to throw this thing off the rails, is it? Uh it, it won't, but um, we have a lot of protocols in place. Do you feel confident that you can keep the kids safe? Very much so. A spokesman for the state health department says that a recent survey finds 30,000 open slots for school-age children in licensed child care centers across North Carolina. In Greensboro, I'm Bill O'Neill, WXII 12 News. If you need to find a licensed child care facility in your neighborhood, this is the number for the state hotline to call 1-800-600-1685. As students and parents get ready for remote learning, some families are now trying to figure out where their child will go when Guilford County returns to in-person instruction. Right now, the plan is for students to return to the classroom in nine weeks, but that is not an option for Middle College at Bennett because Bennett College is online only for this semester. Juniors and seniors at the Middle College will attend class at North Carolina A&T State University when they go back to the classroom. Freshmen and sophomores were given three options of where to attend, and they have to rank their preferences by Monday. The school district says Middle College is not closed. These changes are only temporary for now. First day of school, as we mentioned, for most students in the Piedmont Triad, not all, but the vast majority is this Monday. All students will be doing some form of online learning at least one day a week. Most districts are doing remote learning for at least a month or two to start the new school year. Two children are some of the most recent victims of gun violence in Winston-Salem. Someone shot and killed a 15-year-old yesterday, and a 9-year-old injured in a separate shooting is still in the hospital right now. Justin Trera spoke to an investigator about the search for suspects. And detectives say they believe they've got solid leads in both cases and are closing in on the suspects. Two different shootings leave a 15-year-old dead and a 9-year-old in the hospital all within five miles of each other. That just goes to show these people behind the guns care about nothing in life but what's in front of their eyes and what they're chasing. On Wednesday afternoon, Winston-Salem police say they were called to the 2500 block of North Cleveland Avenue and found 15-year-old Decarius Williams who was shot. He later died. 
Annette Groom says she and her daughter were one of the first people on the scene. That's all I can see is this baby. Yeah. That it could have been one of my grandchildren, you know? I thank God that it wasn't. Then about eight hours later, near the area of North Point Boulevard and North Cliff Drive, a nine-year-old child was hit by gunfire when the vehicle the child was in was shot at. Police say the shooters only care about themselves. They don't understand the end result of these consequences, and it's going to be hard on them when we find them. You know, the justice system is not going to give them a break, these violent offenders. And while police say they have solid leads in both cases, they are still looking for more witnesses and are asking folks in the community to continue to get involved. Moms, dads, aunts, uncles, cousins, getting these, these kids' lice uh, and tell them the importance of how good their life's going to be moving forward. And the 15-year-old who was killed is the 19th homicide in the city so far. On Sunday, community members will lead a procession of empty hearses and will also have a rally, all in an effort to stop the violence. In Winston-Salem tonight, Justin Schreier, WXII 12 News. Local mothers whose sons were murdered will be at Sunday's event. Natasha Miles will stand with Mothers Against Violence. Her son, Kamiko James, was shot at NCANT State University in 2017. Miles says this is not about her and her family, but rather about the families being torn apart now because of violence, and she wants to protect your children. People don't understand that when they choose to pick up a gun, they're affecting families forever. I'll never be the same, and I know my family won't ever be the same. Sunday's procession begins at 4 p.m. in Winston-Salem. Participants will begin lining up at 3.30 at the Bowman Gray Stadium East Lot. The event will end with a rally at Rupert Bell Park. I spoke to another mother who is still waiting for her son's murder to be solved. You can see my full report with a raw emotion and a message from these two mothers who say they want to save your child from being killed. You can see that full report on WXI12.com. A member of the Stokes County Board of Elections is accused of sexually assaulting a child. State agents arrested Harold Mabe yesterday. He is charged with 12 counts of statutory sex offense involving a child. The director of the BOE there says they're gathering information right now and reviewing the circumstances. Leaders in Lexington are now taking legal action in hopes of moving a Confederate monument in the city. The attorney plans to file a complaint in court tomorrow. Our Leanne Denyer has the story about the monument and what the city's mayor is doing about it. This is the Confederate monument at the center of debate between community members in Lexington and Davidson County, as well as the city and county leaders that represent them. In the heart of Lexington, North Carolina, with its shops, restaurants, and businesses, sits a monument. Our situation is unique. We have a statue that sits in our city's center, our economic core, but is on county property. At a Thursday morning news conference, Lexington City Mayor Noel Clark said after weeks of unsuccessful attempts to work with the county, the city council has okayed the city's attorney to move forward with legal action to have the monument removed. These polarizing issues have created dangerous rhetoric and our public safety concerns began on June the 1st. They continue to escalate and persist for 73 days and counting. The mayor called the monument out of line with city values, a nuisance, and the catalyst for ongoing public safety concerns. We're approaching 5,000 man hours uh, that we have spent at that square, and our overtime is in the $40,000 range, just dedicated to the square. Still, some community members feel strongly both for and against its removal. Very hopeful, very hopeful, and uh, I believe in due time it will be. And I hope, hopefully, that it's not going to take that long. If they tear down statue, then it's going to be the courthouse steps going to be the next issue. The city says the United Daughters of the Confederacy hold the last claims of ownership to the monument. The mayor suggested that the monument be moved to a park within Davidson County. The mayor also said that the Board of Commissioners has reached out to him, but that he needed to consult with the city's attorney before moving forward with any conversations. In Lexington, Leanne Denier, WXII 12 News. Leanne, thank you. The county attorney sent a letter to city leaders just last week. It points to a state general statute about the protection of monuments and memorials. According to that statute, the North Carolina Historical Commission needs to approve any monument before it's removed, relocated, or altered.
Face shields and face masks, we see them both when we go out these days, of course, but do they work the same? We ask a local infectious disease expert next. It's been an eventful first round of golf here at the Wyndham Championship. I'm Lauren Walsh. Coming up, we'll fill you in on a few players with local ties who are leading the way on day one. We'll have part of my conversation with the head of the CDC about the safety of sending kids back into the classroom. Also viewing history through a modern lens, how it's changing, how and what kids learn when we see you back here tonight.